You do three. Video one. I can list the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Your libertarians and minarchists and anarchists will say, wait, no, those are the strengths. The Democratic Ideals of Madison, that will be in the next video. So we finished the American Revolution. Now we're going to start America. And America is going to start with the Founding Fathers, the documents that define and describe and set the structure for the American government. So that's going to be the first part of Unit 3, focusing on the documents, the beliefs, and what that government is going to look like. We're going to start out with the Articles of Confederation. The Founding Fathers are coming from a government that had too much power, too much authority, and not enough rule by the people. And so the first focus is we don't want the government to have too much power. We need to limit the government's power. So in America, the revolution's over. We're going to establish our own nation. We're going to establish our own governments. So in these documents where we write down all the details and the blueprints to how this government's going to be set up, we're going to make sure that in these details, we are going to limit, specifically limit, the government's power. And that's one of the main principles of America today and America under the Founding Fathers. That has not changed. That has not changed from a political science perspective, from a social studies perspective, or from an American citizen perspective. When you think of the government, at least most people, when they think of the government and they think of being an American, we think of a government that has limited, not unlimited, limited. The government cannot do anything it wants. We, the people, are going to limit the government's power so that it does not abuse us. Now, that's kind of gone off the rails lately where we've given tons of power to the government over the last 40 to 50 years and expected them to do a bunch of things. But most people still believe that we do, even though we're giving the government a lot of power and we're giving them a lot of authority and we're asking the government to solve all of our problems today. Still in the back of our minds, even the most progressive people watching this video that believe big government and government can solve all of our problems if we just spend more money, even the people that believe in that also accept that, yeah, we still need to limit that big government. Even if you believe in big government today, you still believe that you need to limit big government because sometimes big government can get out of control and can abuse people. There's an example, right? Really, the people, the government is a leash. The government is supposed to serve us. We're going to limit it. How do you limit a dog? You put a leash on it, you limit where it can go. That is the idea of limited government. And we get this idea because we had a king who had unlimited power. The government could pass, the, the, and we remember the coercive acts, and you can go through all the acts that the, the king, the stamp tax, the, the sugar act. I mean, you go through all of these different taxes that the king enforced whenever he wanted to. We don't want that. We want a government that cannot just make whatever rule up they want, wherever they feel is fit. So our first government that we will establish is the Articles of Confederation. Articles, just a fancy word for documents that explain the confederation, which basically means a group. So it's a document that explains the group, the group of states, a confederation, the articles of the documents of the group and the documents of our group explain the rules of our group. Problem with it or the strength of it, if you are a libertarian or a minarchist or an anarchist or if you follow the Mises Institute, it's a strength. But for probably the most people watching this and for your AP test, you want to say that the Articles Confederation is too weak. Well, why would they make this government so weak? In this government that they explain in the document, the Articles of Confederation, why would they specifically detail this document making it too weak? Well, first of all, remember there it's an Articles of Confederation. It's not like the United States that we have today. And even the United States that we have today where all of the states are united together, that really is only under really the last 150 years. The first 150 or so years of America, even under the Constitution, still not completely united. Not until after the Civil War are we really the United States. So remember, it's not really united here for really the first half of our country, just a loose confederation. They're all going to work kind of together, but it's a lot like you would envision Europe today. The European nations get along, they work together, they trade with each other, they have pretty good relationships. They're not going to go to war with each other anytime soon like they did in the past hundred years. They're a loose confederation. It's the European Union, very similar to what the Articles of Confederation was. These states didn't necessarily, or colonies didn't necessarily feel like they had to stick up for each other. They had a, a there was some unifying cultural beliefs and ideas, but New York was not like Georgia whatsoever. Very much like how 
Italy and England, kind of different. Spain and Germany, there's some similarities, but not a lot. Arcus Confederations go through some of the weaknesses. First of all, first form of national government. Cool. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a weakness, but that's just definitely something that will be on your AP exam. Only one branch of government, the executive branch, no judicial branch, and the legislative branch, the branch that makes the laws, was not bicameral. So you just had one legislative branch in this document that could make laws. Very simple. The libertarians, the minarchists, the ideas that will not be on your AP exam are going to say, hey, that's kind of a good thing. Less government, smaller government, allow me to live my life. We like the Articles of Confederation. What the AP is going to tell you and what the majority of regular Americans are going to say, oh, well, that's not enough government. They can't do their job. You need more branches. At least that's what you're going to be told throughout your entire education from kindergarten to graduating from college, and that's going to be in the media, and everyone's going to tell you that the Articles of Confederation was too weak and didn't have enough power. It didn't have enough power to do what? It didn't have enough power to rule your life. <laughs> Think about it. You're going to constantly be told that the Articles of Confederation was too weak. Well, it was too weak to do what? Too weak to rule the citizens? Too weak to coerce the citizens? Too weak to boss the citizens around? That sounds good. Now, don't put that on your AP test, but that's really what we're talking about here. It was too weak to control the citizens. The government writes these content standards. The government writes the text. So they're going to leave out that last part. They're just going to say, the Article of Confederation was too weak. Next question. Wait, too weak to do what? Anyway, don't want to red pill you or anything here. So remember... Just one branch, too weak, too weak, no, no, no. All right, Articles of Confederation, first form of national government, will be replaced by the Constitution. We'll get to that in the next videos coming up. Powerful state governments, weak central governments. Now, you'll hear an honest conversation about this every once in a while where, hey, maybe it would be a better plan, especially in to today and just like in the past where maybe we should allow our states to have a greater impact on the citizens because the individual states know their citizens better, they have a more direct contact with the citizens, they have a better connection with the citizens. Maybe it would make more sense to give the power to the states, that's what the Articles of Confederation did, and have a weaker central government. If anyone is going to control the citizens and boss the citizens, or even serve the citizens, for my progressive friends out there, who would be better to serve the citizens? Would it be the federal government in Washington, D.C., or your state government? Imagine you live in Utah, who is going to be better at serving your needs, progressives? Is it going to be Washington, D.C. that's thousands of miles away? Or is it your local government in Utah? Think about it. That's what the Articles of Confederation did. But again, remember, that's bad according to your AP guidelines. And there are some flaws to it. The federal government could not tax. And when you can't tax, it becomes really hard to enforce laws because you can't hire police to enforce laws, which is... Code word for violently oppress the citizens. <laughs> Some people would say that. Or remain law and order. Whatever way you want to look at it. It's fine by me. But understand that if the government doesn't have tax dollars, then there's not going to be police. There's not going to be security. You have to find another way. And there are many other ways to do it. But we really don't follow those ways. So you don't have police. You don't have military. You, you got to understand that even a lot of libertarians, most maybe not, are going to say that there could be some problems. And if the government has the money, they can't do schools, you know, roads, you name it. That's the regular line that you're going to want to answer on your test. When the government doesn't have tax money, they can't do anything. Yeah, like force the citizens to obey the rules and control the citizens. It sounds like a good idea for me. Let's take that money away. That would be the libertarian argument. The progressive and even most conservatives can say, no, we need the government to have money so we can have structure and so the government can serve us. That's what you should put for your AP guidelines. No president, and then also no common currency, which makes it hard. If I want to spend my South Carolina dollars in New York, they may not accept those. Just like if you take, well, dollar bill pretty much works everywhere. But if you've been to Mexico recently and you have some pesos and you come into America and you want to spend your pesos, the grocery store is not going to accept those. They're going to say, we only accept American dollars. And that was one of the problems that they had. Not a big, huge issue. It could easily be solved, but. They didn't solve it. So let's talk about some more weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. So if you want to pass a new law, the way that the legislative branch worked in the Articles of Confederation was every state got one vote, which, hey, simple enough. There's a problem here because Rhode Island gets one vote. 
And then a state like North Carolina that has many more people has one vote. So in a geographical sense, yeah, all the states are equal. Every state gets one vote. That's fine, but we're a nation of people. We're not a nation of states. We are people. And so when you think of it this way, there's two, there's two ways to look at it, that we are giving the people of Rhode Island way too much power, or we are not giving the people in North Carolina any power at all. Either we're cheating them or helping them way too much, but it doesn't make any sense. The power in the legislative branch today is based on population. The amount of people that live in a state means that state gets more power. And the state has fewer people than it has fewer or as less power in Congress. Under the Articles of Confederation, it didn't matter if there's one person living in your state, you're a state, you get one vote. That's a lot of power when you get to determine who gets to pass laws and not or not. So that's not the most balanced, fair, practical, efficient, effective, maybe it's efficient, effective way of passing laws. You're not really going to set up a good nation moving forward. The other problem is you needed two thirds, not a majority, not a simple majority to pass a law. You needed two thirds of the states to agree, nine of the 13 states. That's very difficult when you look at the, the map. And even today, you're going to see that, well, these southern states are vastly different than these northern states. They're never going to agree on anything. Remember, it's a loose confederation. They're not really united in a similar culture. There's some things that tie them together, but not really. Very hard to pass laws in the Articles of Confederation. Why do we make it so weak? Duh, they didn't want another king. The fear was that if we give the government too much power, like today, they're going to abuse that power, like today. And if we give them too much power and they become really strong, there's no way of pulling it back, like today. I mean, I, I mean one of the crazy ideas, the, the rag on the libertarians and the minarchists, is that they believe that there is some possibility that we are going to pull back the government's authority. The government only gets bigger. The government only gets stronger, no matter who you vote for or how you vote or what you believe. During my lifetime, the government has only grown exponentially, and they were growing exponentially before I was born. And after I die, the government will even have more and more power. What the founding fathers feared is exactly what happened. They created the Articles of Confederation because they feared if we give the government too much power and we create a big, strong central government, it's going to turn into a king. Well, that's kind of what we have today, even though they don't have crowns and they're not prancing around in wigs and giant robes and sitting on thrones. We do have a lot of corporations. We have basically an oligopoly of corporations, very rich elite. They have an insane amount of power and there's absolutely no way that we can dial it back. Then the bigger problem is, is that half of the country doesn't even realize that and they want to keep giving the government more power. It's possible. There's probably only one solution is that people realize, hey, maybe the government has too much power and then maybe we dial it back. But then again, some people like this because they see the government as their big friend and their big buddy. And the more power that it gets, the better it can serve. Just like during, not it's insane to think though, because you're not going to talk this, that not everyone during the American Revolution hated the king. A lot of people were fine with their lives. They didn't mind that there was a king that was making all these laws and had all the authority. They were just going to work every day. They were spending their time with their family. They didn't care about the laws. They didn't care about politics. They were just regular human beings. King, whatever. President, whatever. It doesn't matter. Just like today. It doesn't matter. just want to go about my life. And so all oh, the government got really big and powerful. Whatever. I'm, I'm going to go watch uh, some TV. You guys... You guys keep getting mad about politics. I'm going to be over here. Shay's Rebellion. So during this time, there is a rebellion in Massachusetts. These farmers uh, that fought during the American Revolution are owed money from the war. They are not paid. They have to borrow money to build their farms, and they don't have any money. So they go into debt. And instead of debt forgiveness or working it out, they're thrown in prison. Debtor's prison. You owe the money to the bank. You're just going to go to jail. Yeah, but the government's supposed to pay me, and then if I get that money from the government, then I can pay you the debt I owe for my farm. Well, the government's not paying them, and so they just throw them in jail. There's riot that break out. The government can't really do anything because, remember, they're too weak, and we have rioting, and I mean, it's, I don't know, is it legit rioting? Is it legit protest? I don't really care. They riot. They protest. They burn stuff down. The government can't do anything because we're not taxing. They don't have the authority and enforcement to do it. Eventually, the state governments are able to squash this riot, but it reveals a bigger problem that, hey, maybe we do need to make the government stronger. 
Now, normally when I teach this lesson, people listen like, yeah, you're right. We need a stronger government so people don't lose their mind. Today, as I'm recording this video, that may have changed. A lot of people watching these videos may disagree now. Well, it's probably much more polarized. Before, when I would give this lesson on Shays Rebellion, people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's a riot protest. Maybe you should have a stronger government. Today, given the current circumstances, people are probably on two sides. They say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't want to give the government a monopoly on violence. Google that up if you want to be red pilled. We don't want to give the government a monopoly on violence. You know what a monopoly is? This one person controls every one, one good. A monopoly is where one person controls one good, no one else can compete with them, and they get to make all the decisions about that good. But that can also help with violence, too. And that's really what we have with a government, especially a strong, big federal government. You give it a monopoly on violence. They have the legitimate right to use violence. You don't. You can't kill anyone. No one can kill anyone. No one can fight anyone. But the government has the monopoly on violence. So some people are seeing this, whoa, 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 whoa. If we pay the taxes and make a stronger federal government. We're giving them an monopoly on violence and they're going to use that on the citizens. The other side is going to say, look, the people are out of control. They're burning down government offices. They're burning down official places. They're rioting. We do need a government that can control the citizens. So it's very strange. It used to be everyone would be kind of like, eh, you know, I can kind of see both sides. Today as I record this video, I'm sure that everyone listening is either, we don't want the government to have more power. Unfortunately, the same people that say we don't want the government to have more power are also the people that want a bigger government that has more power that serves them. So unfortunately, the people that have wanted big government their whole life got big government. They wanted big government because they got stuff. They wanted to be helped. They want the citizens to be provided resources. So they got a big government. Problem is you get a big government, that big government can squash any of your protests. And the people who <laughs> said, we want less government, we want a smaller government, they're doing too much. And then you have protests and riots, and then, well, the government can't do anything. As always in these videos, the answer, the truth is somewhere in between. It's not on the far left. It's not on the far right. It's somewhere in the middle. And then someone's going to say, you're a moderate. Get out of here. <laughs> Whatever. All right. We're almost done. So, uh, we'll, Going a little bit long, but we'll, we'll quickly wrap up. So more problems that the American government's running into during the American Revolution. France and Spain gave us money. They gave us ships that helped us defeat the British. And then, hey, it's time to pay it back. We couldn't pay it back. That's a problem. We need to raise money through taxes so we can pay back Spain or France. Or else they're going to do bad things to us. They are strong nations. We barely survived the American Revolution. We're not really ready for War II or War III against France and Spain. We probably ought to pay them back. But the only way we can pay them back is with money. And the only way we can get money is through taxes. But the Articles of Confederation doesn't allow us to tax. Things get worse. So France and Spain, Spain and Spain. Spain and France being upset with us say, all right, well, you can't trade with our colony. So boom, that's going to hurt us even more. So not only are we not getting money through taxes, this is going to economically hurt the United States. But wait, it gets worse. We've got the British who didn't necessarily really leave. And they're going to come back and we're going to fight the War of 1812 because they're sitting there waiting. And we didn't really like knock them out. We didn't dominate them. We just barely luckily won the war. And they know this. So like, all right. We'll let you guys do your thing for a little bit, but we're just going to sit here and wait for our time to attack. Not good. We need to build a military. We need to build a military now and get past this. Oh, yeah, but guess what? The Spanish are still hanging out too, thinking like, well, maybe we're going to jump into this. And then number three, the American Indians are there as well. And guess what? The British are arming the American Indians. So we are in the middle of just a nightmare scenario. And so... It's great that we wanted to create this limited government that didn't have much power. But when you look at what's going on, we owe a bunch of money. Our citizens are rebelling. The British haven't left. The Spanish haven't left. The American Indians haven't left either. They're all waiting to kill us. They are all waiting to kill us. Do you want a limited government in that situation? Let me think of World War II. World War II. Do we want a weak government? Is that what you want? You want a government that can't do anything. There are times where you can make a legitimate argument for a limited, weak government. There are also times where you're going to want to make the argument for having a strong central power that can rally and unite a nation. This would be an example where you needed a stronger government. Oh, but it gets worse because not only is that going on, we're also being attacked when we send our sailors and our merchants over to Europe by the Barbary or Tripoli pirates. Not good. And this is some pretty crazy stuff. If you want to read uh, the 
the whole pirate episode is absolutely fantastic. It's wild. Uh, you may not like Brian Kilmeade. It doesn't matter. Just The book is interesting. It's supposed to be a series or a movie, but very fascinating, action-packed, wild. And a lot of times when we talk about wars and social studies, there's never really a good and bad, and it's confusing, and people don't really like that. People want very simple, just like you see in the movies, the good guys and the bad guys, and nothing in between. And this is a perfect example. This is one of the rare examples maybe in history where there are good guys and there are bad guys. And it's really not that confusing because the bad guys are pirates and pirates are notorious for doing whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, and not following any rules. So it's pretty obvious that the Islamic pirates are the bad guys and that the Americans are actually the innocent good guys in this situation. So if you want a black and white, easy to understand story, then that would be a really interesting book for you to read. But from the big picture, it's a bad time for America as if it wasn't bad enough. Now over in Europe, we're also getting into problems. So this is when James Madison says, hey, the government's too weak. It can't protect us. This whole thing's going to fall apart. America is going to end before it starts. We need to get rid of the Articles of Confederation, and we've got to replace it with a new document that blueprints, details our government, but it has to do so by giving the government more power. And so we'll have the Constitutional Convention, and we'll get after that in the next video.